I'm Dr. Rachel Pizzi at Gallaudet University, and today I'm going to be presenting to you some work done in collaboration with some colleagues at Georgetown University. So I first want to thank Cynthia Fioriti, who's my co-first author, Rich Dacre, and Ian Lyons in the Math Brain Lab at Georgetown. So today I'm going to be talking about a project exploring memory processes, learning, and math anxiety. So math anxiety refers to negative emotion associated with anticipating or completing math calculations. And math anxiety is thought to be especially problematic because it's associated with poor math performance. So previous models of math anxiety are focused on math performance instead of math learning. But what we're really interested in today is how math anxiety affects the process of learning mathematics. So as we develop new proposed ideas for how to understand the association between math learning, math anxiety and math learning, we need new theoretical perspectives to understand not only how performance is impacted, but also how performance change or learning is impacted by math anxiety. So working memory plays an important role in multiple types of learning. And many of the theories focused on math anxiety have illustrated that math anxiety is associated with changes in working memory. So in order to gain a better understanding of how learning is impacted by anxiety, we need to consider specific learning strategies for math and how these skills rely on working memory resources. So thinking about the interaction between strategies like memorization and calculation uh, and how these interact with working memory. So both these skills rely on working memory. And since more math anxious individuals have compromised working memory resources, we need to consider whether compromised working memory may lead to global deficits in math learning or uneven allocation of working memory resources during math learning. So here I'm going to put forth two different accounts or perspectives for how math anxiety might be associated with the learning process for mathematics. So first, thinking about the what we're calling the global learning disruption account. So this is related to a previous account of math anxiety explaining math performance. And this is the idea that working memory and attention are finite resources, and these might be used up by anxiety. So when learning mathematics, we would expect that all processes that rely on these working memory resources might be globally impacted. So for example, a calculation strategy might be less efficient, or we might see reduced learning for a memorization strategy. By contrast, we're putting forth what we're calling the selective learning account. So this is less about working memory capacity overall, and more so about working memory resource allocation. So in this case, both strategies, calculation and memorization, are working memory intensive strategies. So math anxious individuals may be able to channel resources into effort devoted to memorization instead of calculation. So high math anxious individuals may be able to select how to deploy these limited working memory resources, leading to preservation of specific types of learning. So within this account, we would hypothesize that calculation would still be less efficient, but we might see increased learning for memorization that's a preserved learning skill. So in this study, we had people do a lot of multiplication problems. So we had 86 participants come in and do a lot of multiplication problems in the lab. So they came in for a two hour experimental session on two consecutive days. They did 324 problems on each day. And the problems looked a little like this. They would see a fixation, a three digit number multiplied by a one digit number. And then they had to type in their three digit response. They then received feedback as to whether the answer was correct or incorrect. And they were also given the correct answer. So half of these problems are unique problems and half of these problems were repeated within, the, within each block of the session and within the session. So approximately half of the problems that they see are repeated, half are unique. So what did we find? For non-repeated problems, which are over here, oops, sorry, 
branch into the graph a little bit. So for non-repeated problems, which are over here on the right, the more highly math anxious individuals have higher error rates than the low math anxious individuals. This is true for both sessions. So for problems that will almost always rely on some kind of calculation strategy across time, we see that the high math anxiety group has higher error rates than the low math anxiety group. For repeated problems, we see a different pattern. This is where we hope to observe some of the effects of learning over time. And in fact, that's exactly what we've seen. So during session one, high math anxious individuals show significantly higher error rates than the low math anxious individuals. However, by the second session, we no longer observe any significant difference in error rates associated with math anxiety. So for problems that can be actively learned and memorized, high math anxious individuals are able to allocate their working memory resources to a different process, memorization. So although both memorization and calculation are working memory intensive processes, high math anxious individuals seem inclined to allocate their compromised resources to memorization as a learning technique. So we also explored whether this pattern began to emerge even within the first session. And lo and behold, we see that looking within the first session, comparing the first half to the second half, we see a similar pattern of results. So what does this tell us? Overall, by session two, high math anxious individuals no longer showed significant differences in error rates in repeated multiplication problems. So when high math anxious individuals allocate their cognitive resources to a memorization strategy, they're able to improve their performance on math. These results support our selective learning account. And the selective learning account provides this important insight into math anxiety and learning. So working re memory resources may be actively and selectively allocated to memorization strategies, leading specific types of learning to be preserved. So I want to thank again, my wonderful co-authors, uh, Cynthia, Rich, and Ian, and the whole Math Brain Lab over at Georgetown. Um, I also wanna plant a little seed. Uh, Cynthia is also going to be presenting some more about this work at the conference in Belgium. So make sure to go and look up her poster presentation. And thank you all for your time and attention. I'll hand it over to the next speaker, which I think is Belen. Yes. <laughs> so. Uh, should I share? Yep. Okay. Okay, can you see it and listen to me and hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, hi everyone again. My name is Belen Gonzalez Gomez and I'm doing my PhD also in the field of math anxiety. And today I'm going to share with you one of our studies concerning the relationship between, between math anxiety and attention. So, anxiety has been many times associated with an attentional bias to threat. It means that anxiety may favor selection of threatening stimuli more than neutral stimuli. And research has found that anxiety can be associated with three different components of attentional bias. An engagement bias indicates a bias in orienting attention toward threat. A disengagement bias uh, means a greater difficulty in shifting attentional focus away from threat, that is to, to stay attending the threatening stimulus. And an, an avoidance behavior occurs when there is a greater tendency to shift focus far from threat, so that to avoid attending threat. However, in the last years, methodology is usually used to measure attentional bias and to distinguish the, the different components has, have been questioned. And in this context, Grafton and McLeod designed a new methodology, which we use here. And beyond attentional bias, anxiety has been also shown to decrease the efficiency of attentional control, which can contribute to explain how anxiety affects cognitive performance. And moreover, the, this less efficient attentional control might also explain some of the attentional bias observed. But what about math anxiety? So as you already know, uh, math anxiety is the tension and fear that some people feel when dealing with math. 
And so we wonder, is math anxiety linked to an attentional bias for math? So research uh, yield inconsistent results and only mm, um, recently questioned classical measure of attentional bias have been used. And on the other hand, uh, several studies have shown that math anxiety is associated also with a less efficient attentional control. So in this study, we adapted Grafton and McLeod's methodology Two groups with extreme levels of math anxiety uh, perform the task. And in the task, uh, an empty or filled triangle that anchored initial attention was presented, followed by a rapid, a rapid display of two stimuli, being one of them the experimental stimulus, which could be either math or neutral, and could be presented either proximal or distal to the, in, to the initial focus. And finally, another triangle was presented in one of the locations. Some participants were asked to answer if it was the same or different than the former. And symbols were presented very briefly because when using spatial orienting paradigms, longer intervals may generate opposite and counterintuitive result, response time results. So the main aim of our study was to explore if there is any bias towards or against math that modulates initial orienting in high math and Jewish population with a methodology that offers a reliable measure of engagement and disengagement. And moreover, as this is a working memory task and symbols can be considered as distractors, we predicted that high math and Jewish participants would present less efficient attentional control than low math and Jewish participants. And what did we see? So we found no engagement bias to our math stimuli, no delayed disengagement, and no avoidance in any group. As for attentional control, the low math and use group was marginally faster than the high math and use group. And while the, while the low math and use group uh, was faster when they were given a longer presentation time of distractors, the high mahansius group did not show any differences between exposure durations. That suggests that the longer interval was not enough for, for high mahansius participants to start overcoming distraction. So to conclude, math stimuli do not automatically bias the initial spatial orienting of high math anxious individuals' attention. High math anxious individuals may have a bias in selection in a longer term either being more frequent for them to allocate attention to math information or probably in the form of attentional avoidance. But as math stimuli are not likely to affect initial spatial orienting, according to our results, new methodologies beyond spatial orienting are needed to, our, to answer this question. And in any case, as difficulties in executive functions related to attentional control in high math and use individuals are here once again replicated, and ultimately, any attentional bias to math might be explained by those difficulties, as well as by emotional regulation, regulation, which is also related to attentional control. Maybe research should keep focusing in understanding math anxiety effects on attentional control and working memory, so that to develop the most complete intervention that can improve health to high math and use population. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bailen. Uh, we have time for a quick question if anyone has anything they want to ask. All right, now we can move on to Avery. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. All right, thank you guys. Um, my name is Avery Klosser, and I'm excited to share preliminary results from a study that my co-authors, Hannah, Jenny, Aaron, and I have been conducting over the past year. So studying work examples like this one leads to higher and more efficient learning than practicing problems alone, known as the worked example effect. And worked examples with self-explanation prompts are even more effective likely because self-explanation prompts challenge students to actually reflect on the problem-solving process. 
But work examples are normally presented as static images that you could print in textbook. We want to leverage educational technologies to make them more effective for online settings. And we propose that one way to do this is by having students actually interact with the worked examples. For example, Jens and colleagues found that students learn more from tracing worked examples on angle relationships than just viewing them. And in our own previous work, we use Graspable Math, a dynamic notation tool, to study different formats of worked examples. So students viewed worked examples that range from static images like the one on the last slide to looping videos that show the dynamic problem solving process with fluid visualizations like you see here. We found that students improved from pretest to post-test in all conditions, which suggests that viewing different types of worked examples can be helpful. So now we're conducting a two by two study to test whether students learn more when they don't just view worked examples, but actually mirror the steps of the worked examples on screen using a dynamic notation tool and what the impact of self-explanation prompts is. So we asked, do students learn more from viewing or mirroring work examples in an online environment? Do students learn more from studying worked examples with or without self-explanation prompts? And is there an interaction between worked example presentation and self-explanation prompts? So today we're sharing results from a preliminary sample of 64 students across two teachers. All the students were in ninth grade algebra courses. They were 13 to 15 years old, most were 14. We had a pretty even gender distribution um, and a pretty even split between prior experience with graspable math. So the study occurred over three days. Teachers assigned the activity and gave their students a link to the online assignment each day. On day one, students took an A-item pretest on simplifying equations. On day two, they learned how to transform equations in graspable math in a brief tutorial. Then they completed the intervention that it had four practice for four problem pairs. So each pair included a worked example to study, followed by a practice problem to complete. Then on day three, students took an eight item post test. Students followed the same protocol and they were just randomly assigned to a condition on day two. So here's a quick overview of the four conditions. 16 students were assigned to view worked examples. So they were instructed to study the worked example to the left. Once you feel comfortable with the steps taken to solve for the variable, enter the solution below as your answer. 16 students were assigned to mirror worked examples. These students were instructed to use the worked example on the left as a guide to complete the problem below. You may reset the problem as needed. These students use graspable math to actually transform their expression on the right side of the screen to match the worked example on the left. 14 students were assigned to view and explain worked examples. So these worked examples were identical to those in the view condition, plus they had a self-explanation prompt. And then um, 18 students were assigned to mirror and explain worked examples. They received these same instructions as student in the mirror condition and they received the self-explanation prompt. So to answer our research questions, we conducted a two by two by two repeated measures ANOVA. It revealed a main effect of time showing that in general, students did improve from pretest to post-test. Unfortunately, there is no main effect of mirroring versus viewing worked examples. However, there was a marginal effect of self-explanation prompts and a marginal time by self-explanation prompt interaction. So both groups perform comparably a pretest and significantly improved from pre to post-test. But this effect was larger for students in the self-explanation prompt conditions. Specifically, the students who received self-explanation prompts scored higher at post-test than students who did not. So our preliminary evidence seems to support previous research. Students improved about 20% from pretest to post-test after completing the intervention. So we interpret this to mean that the worked example effect is really robust. Perhaps the format of worked examples doesn't matter as much as the worked example practice itself. And these findings are also aligned with our previous research showing that students um, benefited from studying different types of worked examples. And we also saw an emerging trend in favor of the worked examples with the self-explanation prompts, which supports previous work in that area. So that said, we know the sample size is small 
and our results are inconclusive. So we plan to conduct a full round of data collection in the next school year. With the full sample, we will also explore how students self-report cognitive load after the intervention to see how the different worked example formats impact students at a more granular level. And to wrap up, we hope that our findings will advance cognitive theories and also inform how online learning platforms can and should present worked examples to support algebra learning. Thank you all so much. I'm happy to answer questions and feel free to find us on Twitter. Great, thank you, Avery. Um, I don't see, oh yeah, Martha, go ahead. We have a quick question. Yes, thank you, Avery. It's really interesting data. Um, and I, my question has to do with the mirroring condition. I couldn't see because it was small, but whether they were mirroring with the same example or whether they're mirroring with a different example. So they needed to do a kind of mapping process between the given example and the mirroring example. And so I wondered if you could just uh, comment on that. Uh, yeah, and thank you for asking. I'm sorry, I know the images were small. Mm -hmm. um, so they were mirroring with the same worked example with the idea being that they could see each line of the equation on the left side of the screen and then had to figure out what do I need to move and manipulate in graphical math to make my next line look the same as the one in the worked example. And then the practice problem would be similar, but they wouldn't be able to reference the worked example. Got it. Thank you. All right. Um, and there's a quick question in the chat, Avery, was there a significant difference between pretest performance between the two, the two groups? Could the example type be more beneficial to those higher ability staff students? That is actually a great question. Um, and I haven't looked at differences at pretest yet, but that's one of the next steps that we're going to take with the preliminary sample. Um, so thank you for asking. I'd be happy to follow up on that later. All right. Thank you, Avery. Uh, Teresa is not here, so we're going to hand it over to Connor next. Thanks. So uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a project that we've been doing that's investigating the factor structure of the how many and give n tasks. So these two different tasks. Um, are both measures of children's understanding of number words. And in general, children's development of an understanding of number words occurs in two different uh, sets of processes. One is initially, children will use a subitizing based system to make item specific mapping for small numbers. So they'll be able to quickly and accurately identify small set sizes, but not exactly um, be able to represent larger set sizes. Now this changes once children make this connection between counting and set total, and they become cardinality principle knowers. So an understanding of the cardinality principle is usually referred to as knowing that the last word that you count refers to the total number of items that are within that set. So there are these two different processes, one for small numbers that doesn't use counting, and then eventually children do use counting to be able to represent set sizes. And when it comes to measuring children's understanding of the cardinality principle, there are two broad types of tasks um, that you can use. One are set to word tasks, like how many or what's on this card. And in these tasks, children are first provided with the set and they have to produce the proper number word to actually match that set. And if children are using counting here, this is what Fusen calls the count cardinal concept. So this is shown by mapping counting to the cardinality of the set. And the reverse of this um, are word to set tasks. So these are tasks like give n or point to x, where children are provided with the target number word first and then they have to either construct or identify that set total from a few different possibilities. Now here, if children are using counting, this is what Fusen calls the cardinal count concept. And this is uh, when children show that they can map between the cardinality and counting. So it's in the opposite direction of uh, the set to work tasks. So one of the questions that we had here is whether or not these different types of tasks um, are able to be differentiable. Um, so there's a lot of work that shows that tasks like give n are more difficult than tasks like how many, but it's not necessarily the case that just because one task is a more difficult version of another task that's actually tapping into a different underlying concept, or it might be able to be differentiated within a factor analysis. So there's one recent study that suggested that set to word and word to set tasks might be able to be differentiated. So one of the things that we wanted to do was to replicate some of these previous findings and also extend it 
by including a subitizing measure to get at children's understanding of number words without needing to count. So what we did in the current study is we had a sample, an existing sample of 393 children that were between the ages of four and five. And all these children were enrolled in preschool and that is where the data was collected. Now within this study, there were three different measures that we were particularly interested in using. First was a subitizing measure. And in this task, children were shown a card with a set of items on it and they're asked to quickly identify how many they were and they were not allowed to count. And this was for sets one, two, three, and four. Then we had two other measures um, of children's understanding of the cardinality principle. One was the how many task. In this task, children are asked to count a set of items on a card and then say how many there are. And importantly for this, children were asked to separate the count from the cardinality. So they're first asked to count and then they had to separately say how many there are. And then we also had the give end task. And in this task, children are given a pile of items and they're asked to count out a subset of items from that. So for both how many and given, children here were specifically asked to count in order to answer these questions. And they were asked about sets of three, four, eight, 16, and 20. So all children received all of these different set sizes. Now, the first thing that we wanted to do was just replicate previous work, um, looking at the relative difficulty of these two tasks, the how many and the give end task. So on the x-axis here, we have uh, the different set sizes that children were asked about. On the y-axis, we have the percentage of children who were answering correctly for each of those trials, and the different bars reflect the different tasks. So the blue one is the how many task, the orange one is given. And what you can see is that in general, children's performance decreased as set size increased. And then also children perform significantly worse on the given task, and this gap actually increases as the set size increased. So this is really replicating a lot of the previous work that has suggested that given is a more difficult task than how many. And to the extent that these two tasks are um, measuring the same underlying construct, it would suggest that given is uh, really underestimating what children know. However, we were interested in taking that further step and looking at what the actual factor structure was between these different tasks. So to do that, we used uh, four different models that we fit in a confirmatory factor analysis. First, we had a one-factor model that treated the subitizing how many and give end tasks as all tapping into one underlying cardinality factor. We also had a two-factor model that treated the subitizing task separate from the cardinality principle task. So in the subitizing task, there was no counting that was required. And in both the how many and the give end tasks, counting was required to be able to answer. So here that separated the subitizing from the cardinality principle. And we also fit a three-factor model that treated subitizing how many and give n as separate factors that tap, tapped into those specific items for that task. And these different factors were allowed to correlate. And then lastly, we fit a, a bifactor model. So this had one general understanding of cardinality that loaded onto each item, uh, but this was orthogonal and allowed for each task to also have task-specific variants. And what we ended up finding was that the best fitting factor structure was really that three factor model. So one that allowed um, the subitizing how many and give end tasks to be differentiated within a uh, factor analysis, but those items were still allowed or those factors were still allowed to correlate. So some of the takeaways from these, uh, from this findings, these findings are that uh, performance on give end lags behind performance on how many. So this is a replication of a lot of work that has happened already that suggests give end is a more difficult task. And it also suggests that the best fitting factor structure for these tasks shows distinct variants for each of these different measures. So the given and how many tasks, although they are very highly related, um, they're very highly correlated with our factor structure, um, they are able to be separated within that factor analysis, which suggests that they might be tapping into um, different underlying constructs. So this really highlights um, within this area that researchers need to be using multiple tasks if they want to gauge a complete understanding of children's understanding of cardinality. So given and how many are both tapping into something about children's um, knowledge of how counting and set size uh, are related, but they're doing so in different ways. And that's able to be separated out within the factor analysis. Right, so thank you, everybody. I'm happy to answer any questions um, in the chat or um, over Zoom as the next talk gets sets up. Thank you, Connor. Yeah. Do we have any other questions for Connor real quick? 
Martha. Or, oh, you were just clapping, sorry. <laughs> you came to the top. Um, Andy, go ahead. Hi, I was typing out a question, but I um, figured I'd ask it here. Uh, great presentation, really exciting. Um, love to see some measurement work. I wonder if um, we could create a giant data set with more, um, more measures if we might see evidence for um, number specific uh, factors rather than task specific factors. Do you have any thoughts about whether that's something that might develop in, in kind of that categorical approach to um, to thinking about understanding cardinality rather than kind of what the task specific demands require. Obviously, there's reasons for minimizing measurement invariance or measurement error across either way, but um, curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, so are you talking more about like, could in a factor analysis we show like knower levels might? Yeah, essentially like, do we have, a, do we come up with a factor that represents one across subitizing given number and a how many task, um, mm -hmm. two, three. Um, yeah, that, that is something that, I mean, I would be very interested to see how that works. It's something that we've thought about doing in the past, but just didn't have the data. So that is certainly something I'll be interested in following up and seeing if we could get enough people involved to get enough of that data to be able to, to answer some of those questions. I'm sure folks have the data if, if we want to just kind of put together a data set and run it. Yeah, so that's a great idea. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, Connor. All right. Uh, Rosario, if you want to set up. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Can you see the presentation? Okay, perfect. Uh, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, my name is Rosario Sanchez, and I will be presenting the communication uh, numerical patterns finger are more than just an external aid. Uh, well, I will start this presentation with a brief summary trying to explain why are we interested in studying fingers. Uh, fingers can be an external aid to represent numbers, and in this sense, it has been suggested that they could play a functional role in the development of basic numerical abilities. Even some authors have suggested that fingers could be the missing tool or the missing link between children's capacity for numerosity and symbol numbers. These finger arrangements have the specificity to represent quantities non-symbolically, for example, one, two, three, and being processed and symbolic stimuli, three. But this is uh, still discussed if fingers patterns are more than a simple numerical representation or not. In this study, we focus in non-symbolic quantities and we wanted to analyze whether the processing of finger representations is different from other representation formats. To answer this question, we designed an experiment with uh, four different tasks. In the first task, uh, children were presented with canonical finger monitoring representations and had to decide as quickly and accurately as possible how many fingers were raised. And numbers from uh, one to nine were presented. The second task was designed after the, pre the previous one, but in this case, instead of presenting two hands, two mountains with buildings were presented. In the third task, children saw dots arranged uh, in patterns like those on dices. And finally, in the fourth task, participants were presented with different arranges of dots randomly distributed. And 147 children uh, from three different schools were assessed in this experiment. And what did we find? Uh, well, in order to analyze the recognition of uh, these representations and how this change depending on the number or the type of pattern, reaction time and accuracy were analyzed. In this slide, we can see the classical size effect 
for all the representations, that is the reaction time of the different tasks increases with the size of numbers. Although the reaction time for finger pattern task is lower than uh, the other tasks. And here we can see how the accuracy decreases with the size of the numbers. And again, the accuracy in finger pattern task is higher than in the rest of tasks. After analyzing what happened uh, with numbers from one to nine, uh, we fitted a mixed model with three different segments, uh, one to two, three to five, and six to nine. And it is important to note that in young children, uh, the pattern of errors may be more informative of a child's ability to operate with numerical representations than reaction time. The, so we will focus on reaction time for small numbers when the accuracy is the same, and we will consider accuracy for the remaining numbers. Uh, well, size and representation format were, were significant predictors of reaction time and accuracy in all segments. And with numbers one to two, post hoc text uh, showed that dice and dots were responded faster than fingers. This fact could be explained because when children see a finger, they also have to process the entire hand and maybe uh, there are more distractors present. Nevertheless, the difference in uh, milliseconds is uh, minuscule. In the case of numbers from three to five, uh, fingers and dice uh, were less error prone than buildings and dots. And the advantage of fingers and dice suggests a sort of conceptual subitizing in comparison with uh, the performance on building and dots, which are more likely to trigger uh, counting processes. Note also that fingers outperform buildings, even if they share a similar spatial arrangement. And in the case of numbers from six to nine, fingers were uh, was learned less error prone than buildings and dice. And performance in buildings was better than dice, suggesting that the spatial arrangement of both fingers and buildings allows more, effect more effective counting. Moreover, finger task was better than buildings, suggesting that finger probably allows counting on processes, that, that is, if children don't recognize the complete finger pattern, they can recognize maybe five plus one, and they can start counting from five. With these results, we can conclude that in general, children saw better performance in tasks with similar uh, with familiar patterns, that, that is fingers and dice. And uh, the largest differences were found in the largest quantity, being children faster and less error prone with fingers rather than with the rest of representations. These results speak about the possible advantage and role of fingers in the acquisition of number knowledge early in development, although more research is needed to prove that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Rosario. Uh, Martha, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to know about the um, finger patterns for the larger numbers. Were they always the conventional ones or were they sometimes um, ones, I mean, you can represent six in the conventional way or you could present three on each hand or four and two or, you know, you could do it lots of different ways. And so I wondered um, if you considered that. Uh, yeah, you are right. Uh, but in this case, with this task, we only use canonical finger pattern representations. But we are thinking about that, maybe if, if it's worth it to use this kind of patterns that you said, and also another kind of pattern like a non-canonical one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Alaria, I see, I see you have your hand raised. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, my question is similar, but regarding the dice patterns, I was surprised to see that the dice patterns uh, for larger numbers uh, was so much lower than the actual new version you made. So did you use for 
producing nine, did you use six plus three or did you actually use five plus four? Because I think that might be important because the break on the hands is five, whereas the dice patterns usually go up to six. So I was curious to know how you built those stimuli. Yeah, uh, we built the pattern uh, uh, like uh, the previous one, but we didn't use a pattern similar to uh, fingers. As you said, for example, we didn't use five plus three, like in fingers. We use another pattern with two columns of four points uh, each column. So it's uh, very possible that children are not familiar with this kind of patterns. And it, this is what explains what happened with these patterns. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Renee. I, I love everything about this study um, and because it, it leads to so many more questions as we've seen here. So one thing I was wondering, you know, in future studies, if you could use um, tally marks, um, you know, in lieu of or in addition to the buildings, just because there's less there to visually process and perhaps, uh, I mean, depending on the culture, they might be more familiar with tally marks. Just thinking about how tally marks are similar to fingers minus the hand. So I would just love to see you do add that into your study too. We, we didn't uh, take that into account uh, till now, but uh, we will be so happy to revise this information. So thank you very much for your uh, comment. Thank you. Great, and then Martha just had a, a clarifying question of, uh, did performance on the buildings item improve over the session as learners became more familiar? Uh, no, it it was one session, mm -hmm. so uh, the performance didn't uh, improve. In this study, we didn't uh, test uh, children twice. We only test them once. Right, I just meant whether from the very early trials to the later trials, maybe they started to realize that the buildings are like hands and they might start to process them more similarly to fingers with a little more familiarity. So I was thinking about early items within the session versus later items. We, we didn't revise exactly that information, but maybe it's worth it to take a look to see what happens. Thank you, thank you very much for all your comments, very insight. Thank you, very interesting work. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you, Rosario. Um, and thank you all for all the questions. Rosario, can you stop? Yes, yeah, yeah. All Sorry. right, no, you're good. Um, uh, Laura, you are yes. our last presenter. Yes, today. okay. Right. Can you see my screen? Yes. We see, we see the end. So yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. okay. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Laura Matilla from University of Salamanca. I'm here to suppose uh, our research title, My P Mapping Between Number Words, Writing Digits, Dot Arrays, and Finger Configurations in Preschoolers. In first place, uh, we would like to remember that traditionally it has been considered that there are three different codes in which numerical information can be represented. Verbal number words, written digits, and non-symbolic quantities such as dot arrays. And this is the traditional task to measure the accuracy of these mappings. But it's also possible representing numbers with finger configuration. Indeed, children use their fingers to communicate numbers as early as three years of age. What is not clear is whether these representations are symbolic or not symbolic. <clears throat> How children learn to map across the, these codes has been the focus of ongoing debate. Whilst prior research has largely focused on mapping between number words, digits, and dot arrays, less is known about the mapping involving fingers configurations. So the main goal in, in our research was to analyze mappings between fingers and other representations in preschool children, 
Specifically, we were interested in knowing which mappings are the first to be acquired and conclude if finger representations are symbolic or non-symbolic. To test this question, we use in our study a total sample of 215 children, aged three and four year. Uh, and we use a total of six tasks where a, a, a total of six tasks were applied. Each of them in the two possible mapping directions. So we combine the four codes or four formats in both directions. And we divide the items in three different sizes, the small size, including numbers two and three, medium size, numbers four and five, and large for six and seven. We perform a repeated measure SANOVA with mapping task uh, and size as uh, within subject factors and eight as a between subject factor. Results reveal that the probability of transcoding efficiently across different numerical representations differs across uh, types of mapping and also as a function of number size. This graph shows the main effect of the projection variable. As we can see, typical symbolic projections words and digits is the one that uh, children learn first. And they have a better performance in the fingers condition than in the non-symbolic non -symbolic task. Therefore, performance on finger representation is more similar to performance on symbolic projections. When we consider performance on mapping task as a fun function of size, small, medium, and large, we found similar results. For small size, they show similar performance. In large size, um, it's the condition in which we found more differences, especially in the word digit task. Nevertheless, we can see that performance is always better for the symbolic projections. And again, performance on finger condition is better than in non-symbolic condition. <clears throat> Finally, we include the age. With a, when we include the age, we find different results per size. For the small size items, we see that differences decrease. In fact, for four-year-old children, there is a sailing effect. Nonetheless, for medium and large items, we found again the differences between symbolic and non-symbolic projections. And uh, if we focus on large items, the graph perfectly shows that the first projections that children learn are the symbolic ones. In conclusion, in first place, and uh, according to previous research, the first projection, projections that uh, children learn are the symbolic ones. In second place, this find, these findings provide uh, further support to the symbolic properties of finger configurations and the role that these patterns may have for the acquisition of the concept of number at early stage in development. In this context, we are analyzing um, in a longitudinal study the role that these finger representations may play in the acquisition of the number concept. And that's all. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Laura. Do we have any questions for Laura? All right, do we have any questions for any of our presenters today?
All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and thank you to all of our presenters. You guys did a great job. Um, and I'll let everyone have seven minutes of their life back. So enjoy the rest of your day and weekend. And thank you all so much. We'll see you next week. <laughs>